Tara, thanks so much for taking the time today. Hi, Mark. It's a pleasure, as always. Well, listen, I'm really excited to dive right into talking about your phenomenal new book, uh, Source, which is uh, tremendous in the fact that it really permeates a lot of different uh, areas of performance. And, you know, for me, an evolutionary um, perspective on things really helps me to to navigate, you know, complex problems. And so, you know, from your standpoint, you know, what aspects of the brain are symptoms of evolutionary hardwiring that we really most need to fight against and retrain? Great question. Thank you. I do love making these parallels between how we lived in the cave and the things that made us actually survive and, and essentially become the most successful animal on the planet. And then the the aspects of, of those things that don't serve us any longer. So, um, I, you know, I, I don't actually like to use the word hardwired because of what we know about neuroplasticity now, which is mm-hmm. the ability of the brain to change itself and how much it does change, even if we're not conscious of it. Um, but you're so right. There are some things that have literally been in our brains for millennia. And I guess the, the most alarming one is um, about unconscious bias. So when we lived in the cave, we, we survived in tribes of no more than 150 people. So we could essentially recognize everybody in our tribe. Um, but even then, the tribes were delineated according to skin color, hair texture, eye shape, eye color, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And although that no longer serves us and, and you know, is, isn't relevant, some of those things are still in our brain. So it's with everything that you and I will talk about, and I know, you know, about in your work as well, it's always about raising from non-conscious to conscious, whether it's your biases, whether it's behavior patterns that drive you, but you're not aware of it. Um, anything at all, the more you raise your awareness of it, that's when you can use the power of neuroplasticity to make any changes that you might desire. And are there strategies, Tara, for being able to, to do that, to help us go from the unconscious to conscious? So I've tried to make the book really practical. So there are lots of exercises in it that help with this kind of thing. But I do think it starts with journaling. Um, I, I had a very regular journaling practice myself before I started writing the book. And was quite shocked at when you read over the last three or six months, how many times I was thinking and saying the same thing, but expecting things to change around me. (laughs) That's very true, right? I think we can all relate to that. Um, It's it's funny, though, because sometimes when you think about journaling, that doesn't necessarily include reading back over your entries. Um, But to me, that was the most insightful part of having kept a journal. Um, So either by journaling or obviously speaking to a coach, a therapist, a friend, um, just to get that other perspective. Because, you know, what everything we see, we see as a fact because it's filtered by our own perspectives. Um, but we don't know what we don't know. So whether it's journaling, whether it's talking to someone else or doing some specific exercises that look at behavior patterns that are so natural for you that you're not aware of them, um, those are the main ways of doing it. I mean, I guess things like meditation and contemplation um, lead to that too. I just like to be really practical and, and offer people tangible solutions rather than just think about mm-hmm. you know what's worked and not worked kind of thing. Absolutely, and that's a powerful insight to go back over the journaling because I think you know whether it's nutrition or training, oftentimes you know athletes, clients will get so stuck into the moment that without going back to look at what they've done in the past and and that progression that really starts to elucidate a lot of the patterns, as you mentioned there, that are maybe holding us back and, and some of the lessons that we're learning. And of course, in today's society, we're, you know, we're always doing now where you don't have a chance to sort of go for a walk and let our thoughts percolate around where we're always tuning in and trying to get more and more information. And we seem to be going from, you know, more emotional beings to more logically driven beings. And, you know, there are some consequences to that, which you talk about in the book. Could you share some of those? Yes, it really relates back nicely to how you started off asking about evolution. And of course, at one point, we were, us humans, we're walking around on the savanna with other animals, and we were nothing special. Um, at that time, we had a well-developed limbic system, which is the more emotional, intuitive parts of the brain. And your own limbic system is about the size of your clenched fist. So you can imagine that inside your skull. 
-hmm. And then around that, we had a very thin layer of of the outer cortex, which are the more rational um, regulatory processes in the brain. And it was around the time that we discovered fire. And we, we don't know if we discovered fire by accident and then we were able to control it and cook meat and therefore digest protein more efficiently and that that's when our cortex grew or it may be that we naturally evolved to grow a larger cortex and then we were able to use tools and and make and control fire but either way that is basically our first cognitive revolution and so our cortex massively grew to become about as thick as the limbic system and that's why we have such a large skull now and that meant that we could try to predict and plan for the future, and we developed the ability to articulate speech. Now, once you can speak, then, you know, if you say something to me, I say something to you, we take that very much at face value. Mm -hmm. We don't pay as much attention to body language, and we certainly don't pay much attention to the primal feelings that we get just by being around each other. So those layers of being that actually led us to become the most successful animal on the planet We've demoted things like emotion and equated that to weakness. We've, until recently, with the brain scanning t- studies, we've kind of said, well, intuition isn't a real thing. You know, how do you know it's, it's right? Exactly. Um, but we've said that logic is, it's facts, it's data, it's the best way of thinking. That's what we should all be doing. And I just don't agree with that. I mean, it's, it's, it is so impressive and amazing. You know, I'm always brought back to comments by our sports psychologist, uh, Dr. Peter Jensen, who talks all about how emotions drive behavior. And, you know, 90% of the decisions we make are, are driven by emotion. And so it's, mm. it is, uh, you know, even if we're in a scientific world and trying to, you know, obviously make evidence-based choices, it's, you, we can't tease out this emotional aspect. And as you talk about in the book, it can, it's obviously a big throttle to be able to propel our ability to perform in all domains as well, right? Mm. Yeah, and that's why I talk about mastering your emotions. So it's not about being emotional. Um, It's not about having too much or too little emotion. It's about having that really perfect range that actually, you know, it makes us less stressed, it makes us well, and and it can lead to higher performance. And, you know, that is one of the six in in my brain agility model. But I've purposely put it as number one to, to... sort of build up the importance of it. And I've put logic at number four. So I'll just run through them for the listeners. I was going to say, Um, yeah, the brain agility (laughs) model is definitely something that I think all the listeners are really going to uh, gravitate towards for sure. So if you could walk through that, would be terrific. Yeah, I thought you'd like like that. Um, So I've put number one, mastering your emotions. Number two is know yourself, which is the brain body connection. You know, probably quite obvious to many of your listeners, but I can tell you in business where I do most of my consulting, it's It's not even thought of as a concept. Um, Third is trust your gut, which is listening to your intuition. Fourth is logic, which is make good decisions. Fifth is stay motivated and resilient to reach your goals. And bringing all of those together is using your brain power to create the life that you desire or the outcomes that you want in the real world. Yeah, it is such a great exercise to be thinking in all those different ways and you as you mentioned you outlined some great um tools and 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 tactics that people can use in the book to kind of work through this and because it's not always self-evident is it i mean when you actually put pen to paper and and think about a, a challenge or a problem and all these different ways of thinking about it as in the journaling example that you gave previously you know looking back on this you can start to see patterns emerge where we tend to default to certain ways of those six that we tend to always use and others that we may not be using as much. Is that that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. And that's where the neuroplasticity piece comes in because it's not about being good at everything or equal at everything. It's about understanding where your strengths and preferences lie and absolutely playing to those strengths. And then getting yourself to the point of comfort where you can say, okay, if there was a crisis or something suddenly changed around me, even though I'm primarily logical and I'm quite creative, I could think intuitively or, or use my empathy if I needed to. Um, again, in the sort of industries that I work in, the physicality aspect is usually the lowest one. So, you know, there are some quite simple things that you can do there to 
um, build up your sense of interoception, which is the physiological state of the inside of your body. Um, I always say to people, if you've got young children, then, you know, watching them go from not being able to tell you when they need to go to the loo or they're hungry, um, to the bathroom, sorry, mm -hmm, yeah, no, um, for sure. <laughs> to, to the fact that, you know, they, they learn what it feels like when they need to use the bathroom, when they're hungry, when they're tired, they can tell you that instead of crying. And it's kind of the same with us. So basically, all of those six pathways in the brain, some of them will be like super highways in your brain, and some of them will be a bit more like a dirt road. And it's exactly the same physiological process, um, building up those pathways to be more like super highways, as if you were learning a new language. So, you know, let's say you decided to learn French. Um, if you downloaded an app and you, you know, you practiced whenever you had some spare time, but you didn't plan to go to the French speaking part of Canada anytime soon, then you, in six months time, you might have picked up a few words, you might feel like you could start a very basic conversation. But instead, if you signed up to a French class, you went to the class every week, you did your homework, and you knew that you had a test at the end of it, or that you were going to go um, to a part of the country where most people speak French, then the chances are that you would have built that pathway up much better than the half-hearted attempt. So sure. it's like that. With, yeah, it's like that with everything. You know, if it's if it's build up your emotional intelligence, then you have to do the listening, the eye contact, the paying attention, the not interrupting um, until that becomes natural for you. Yeah, it's fascinating to think about. I mean, how much does our environment play a role? As you mentioned there, if you're going to go and travel to somewhere, you know, in Quebec and Canada, or if you're going to live in France, and when you're in that location trying to learn that language, I, I assume that gets back to the motivation factor of, of, you know, you can't escape it. You literally have, you're in, in the deep end and you've got to now take on board these new words and this new way of communicating. But it is amazing how much more quickly, you know, we can learn when we're fully immersed if we use the, you know, the language uh, example. Totally. I mean, I don't know if this says something about me, Mark, but I find that the times that I've been most successful in my life was when I didn't have a choice. I felt like, you know, like, for example, when I changed career from being a doctor to starting up my coaching and speaking practice, um, there was a point where I could, couldn't afford to pay my rent. And some people said to me, if you just went back to the hospital and did a locum for one weekend, you could earn enough money to cover your rent for the next few months. But for me, going back to something felt like a failure. And I, I knew that I had to have a single point of focus and I had to keep moving forward. And actually, that slightly scary feeling of, um, you know, that if I didn't make it work, I, I would really like not have stability and security in my life probably drove me. But again, Absolutely. you know, like we were saying, yeah, I mean, you want the right level of balance. You don't, you don't want to be so stressed. Um, and, you know, putting your basic life foundations at risk, you need to have the positive motivation as well. But sometimes a little bit of fear does drive performance, as I'm sure you know. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that's something that, you know, athletes, even performance staff, coaches all the way up can all relate to of that idea of, yeah, we're going to, this is the decision, we've got to march forward and, and figure out a way to get this done. And I think that's really refreshing to hear. And, and the example you gave around brain agility, it's interesting, again, to think about, you know, how front offices, the different pathways that they might emphasize more than others, and, and how the coaches as well, the different pathways to the front office, and then, again, performance staff to athletes. So really a fascinating uh, example there. And in the book as well, Tara, you talk about, obviously, the importance of developing metacognition, you know, thinking about thinking, which, you know, is, is something quite big to unpack. Can you unpack that a little bit for listeners? Well, it relates back to what you asked me earlier about, you know, how do you raise from non-conscious to conscious what the things that might be holding you back or just the patterns that you've got into. They may not be bad habits, but they're habits all the same. Um, so metacognition, as you've said, is thinking about your own thinking. And we don't really tend to do that, partly because, again, as you said, we're so busy, we're bombarded with so much information, we just get on with it. And the brain is a very energy hungry organ that doesn't want to give up resources unless it has to. So the, the, nat the default is to just carry on thinking the way that you always have. I think if you, if you know, whether, whether it's physically or mentally, if you want to evolve to the next level, if you want that edge, if you want to be your best self, 
you do need to take the time to step back and look at what your life looks like now. You know, really, I think, you know, quite a poignant question is, is your life now everything that you always dreamed it would be? And if the answer to that is no, then you need to make the time and space to reflect on your thinking, to do these exercises, to really surface the barriers that are holding you back from being your best, most successful self. Um, and reframing some of your thinking towards, you know, whether it's about more abundant thinking, whether it's about doing more visualization of future success, um, finding out what that thing is that's going to transform your life for you. Yeah, it's a terrific point. And of course, in today's environment where there's so much noise and, you know, things like social media and podcasts are terrific for purposes like Mm -hmm. this, but I mean, it can become overwhelming. We sort of live in this, uh, you know, as Daniel Goldman says, this epidemic of absence of attention. And so, you know, one has to be quite proactive, don't they, in carving out time to to think and to to do nothing, so to speak, whereas before it almost was built into just how we lived. Is that that fair to say? Yeah, I I really, I love the way you think, because I can see all the interconnections in what you're saying, because you know, this again relates back to when we lived in the cave. We naturally walked barefoot in nature. We sat around the campfire with our families every night. We looked at the stars in the sky. And who does that now? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it's it's not normal to do it. I actually do do those things because I I make myself do them because I'm so aware of the fact that it's just easy to be on your device the whole time, you know, and not do any of those things. But also it's it's really lovely because I spoke at a school yesterday in Boston and um, attempt, cultivation of attention was actually what the principal was was saying that they're trying to do through the speaker series that they're bringing in for the children. Um, and, you know, I think particularly for teenagers, it's it's a whole different world of multiple distractions and multitasking and expectations that are just so draining for um, the brain. And so one of the things... I took in these packs of little temporary tattoos that are called mindful marks. And they have little um, affirmations that go with them, like um, I unlock my true potential. I view the world abundantly. I visualize a powerful path. And it's even tiny things like that, that, you know, obviously the little tattoos appeal to the kids. Um, and but the if adults it's your- sometimes do, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you a pack, Mark. Nice, perfect. <laughs> Yes, I think, you know, trying to bring those little points of mindfulness into your life, like, for example, mindful eating, that gives me three anchors in a day where I can put my devices away, I can be quiet, I can savor and focus on the thing that I'm doing in a very, you know, single minded way. Um, However, given what you've what you've mentioned about the constant distractions and social media, I am a massive advocate of digital detoxes as well, because You know, when you say you really have to step back and create the time, well, if you don't use your phone for two days or two weeks, you have a massive amount of time. It's shocking. Yeah, it really is shocking. And I think that notion around, I mean, obviously, we're so pattern oriented. And so yeah, not using your phones when we're eating, as you mentioned, all of a sudden, we're, you know, there's an hour that we're going to have in the day, or another one is even just walking around. I mean, it's amazing. When you sort of stop and lift your head up, but watching people in central London or downtown Toronto. I mean, everyone is staring down at their phone as they even walk now. It's almost, uh, you know, epidemic sort of levels. And so those are some opportunities when you're walking, looking in the distance, you know, let those thoughts percolate um, that we can start to carve out, right? Absolutely. And, you know, maybe even take it one step further and smile at a stranger or talk to somebody who has a totally different life to you. I mean, you know, the more we expose our brains to new and different experiences, the more it opens up those filters that we've become so accustomed to. Um, so, so there's that. And then there's another thing I really wanted to mention to you, which may seem unrelated, but I think the, rela- the, the connection in my mind is about eating different types of food. Mm-hmm. So again, we get into patterns with the kind of foods that we eat, maybe because of how we grew up or where we live. Um, but the more that you expose your gut to diverse diets, um, the better that is for the quality and um, quantity of gut bacteria that you have. Mm -hmm. And the connection between the brain, the gut and the gut bacteria is a really exciting new field of research. 
So we know, for example, that if you take a good quality probiotic for one month, you have less negative thinking, less anxiety, and um, some people have even been able to reduce or come off their antidepressant medication. Um, so if you take that away from the, the negatives and you think, okay, if you're quite healthy, if you're quite high performing and you take a probiotic and you increase the diversity in your diet, then you build up um, better quality and more diverse strains of bacteria in your gut that lead to improvements in mental performance, that lead to improvements in physical health, like resilience to stress. Um, it's a really exciting field, which I just think is so relevant to your listeners. Yeah, it is um, amazing. Um, I had uh, Miguel Mateus on, I think it was last season, and he was talking about his research and the 50 food challenge, as you mentioned, the food diversity, having a broad spectrum of foods to help build gut diversity. And in athletes, mm -hmm. we know that, you know, a lot of aerobic training is terrific for the gut bacteria and, and fitness levels and protein intake, but um, a lot of athletes and active people eat processed food diets as well. So just as you mentioned, yeah. you know, layering in a probiotic can be a really nice strategy to help uh, support that diversity. And Doc, when we talk about aligning, we've talked about emotions here today, um, being so key for really propelling mental performance. You know, how does one start to align this sort of rational and emotional thinking, particularly in, in, in individuals or industries where that rational thinking is, is more predominant? Yeah, it's, it's been such a theme um, for me recently in my teaching at MIT Sloan, where you know people have raised this question of, can you actually be really smart and really emotionally intelligent, like in one brain? Um, and I have to say, I find it quite disheartening that that's still a question. Um, so, and I think what's contributed to it is this old, you know, it's become a neuro myth because it was an old way of thinking that we've realized isn't true, but the left and right brain lateralization theory mm -hmm. that, you know, we know that it's not the case now that we have sophisticated scanning techniques for the brain, but it's been around for so long that a lot of people still think it's true or use it, um, in their explanations for their behavior. Um, such a theme here actually for, you know, our own behavior patterns, which is just because it's been there for a long time we still think it's true. We can't change our mind about it. A little bit like the unconscious biases that we started off speaking about. So I think it's really important for people like you and I to, you know, to speak out more about the fact that it's it's much more about systems that move around the brain that are interconnected. It's not about your, you know, anything's in, just in the right and something else in the left and that logic and emotion are disconnected like that. Just like you mentioned earlier, um, all of our logical decisions are biased by our emotions because of the way that information comes into the brain. So it comes in through our body, through our five senses, up the spinal cord, through the limbic system, and then gets um, sent around the cortex. And so the fact that information has already flowed through the limbic system before it even reaches the cortex demonstrates that you know all of our logical decisions are biased by emotion. So I think if we can get people thinking about the structure of the brain, the interconnectedness of all the pathways, and that these different ways of thinking are not mutually exclusive, that you can build on all of them. And, you know, I always say to my clients, I know that you're so good at your technical, logical skills, but I also know that you can be so good at the empathy and the attention and the um, compassion skills that are just in a different pathway in your brain. Yeah, that's definitely um, something that, you know, we often hear, you know, scientists or if we're working in a sporting environment, if a, let's say a supplement only has a placebo effect, you know, the staff is less likely to want to deliver that strategy. Whereas when you talk to athletes, I mean, they want every placebo effect they can get. I mean, if this is, you know, <laughs> they're like, bring it on. If, I, if, if it's going to make me, you know, if I feel like it's going to make me perform better, um, that trumps all. And you hear that now with performance staff saying, well, how the athlete feels, particularly when we talk about the science of recovery, which is, you know, a new science in the last sort of decade. And, and, you know, the best experts in the world keep telling us, well, what does the athlete like best? What will they continually do? And so it is amazing how it is all bathed through our own perceptions there. And, and Doc, I want to respect your time. I know you're very busy. So, you know, last couple of questions for you. I think anyone can relate to this question. You know, if you're in your workplace and your career and you're perhaps hit a plateau or stuck and, you know, you've touched on this a little bit before, maybe unhappy in the, in the place that you're in, you know, 
how is looking to the brain for solutions again going to help propel uh, a person to their performance potential? Yeah, really good question. And, you know, again, it's a little bit disheartening, but I see this issue so much. People unhappy at work or in a relationship, but just feel totally trapped. And so, I mean, looking to the brain, it you know, it's it seems obvious to me from the cognitive science point of view that that how you think inevitably influences your your happiness, your health, your wealth, your quality of your relationships. And so that's why I felt it was so important that psychology and neuroscience should um, inform things like abundant thinking, um, visualization. And so I'm going to go here to one of the key points in my book, which is about creating a vision board. Um, however, I do call it an action board because it's not about creating an image of the ideal life that you want and then waiting for it to come true. You have to do things every day to make it come true. But Terrific. if you're... Um, if you're in a stuck position like that, which so many people are, then at the actual act of creating a collage by hand, although it can also be done digitally these days, with metaphorical representations of everything that you would like your life to look like, it actually, through some processes in the brain called selective attention and filtering and value tagging, it actually primes your subconscious to notice and grasp opportunities that might otherwise have passed you by. It's so easy to understand that if you get into this negative spiral, if you start feeling like there's not enough opportunity out there for everyone, then you're not going to do things to put yourself at risk. If you do take some time to reflect on what you would really like your life to look like and you create this imagery to represent it, um, I keep mine by my bed so that I always look at it lasting at night because there's a psychological phenomenon called the Tetris effect, which is, did you ever play Tetris? On I your did game play board? Tetris, yeah. <laughs> and do you remember that when you, when you close your eyes to go to sleep, you could see the bricks falling down in Absolutely. front of your eyes? So that's the, one of the priming effects on the brain. The last thing you look at before you fall asleep has a very powerful effect on your subconscious. Um, and you know, I've been doing these for years and they've worked for me, but I did feel compelled to look into the science behind why a vision board or visualization would work. And I was really stunned by, um, the, you know, it was so easy to find the scientific explanation for it. And wow. a lot, yeah. And, you know, a lot of people have said to me that I've heard about vision boards before, but when I, you know, understood the science, then I was compelled to make one. So I really hope that your listeners will go out and do that, particularly if they're feeling stuck and trapped at the moment. Perfect. Terrific challenge to throw out to, the, to everyone as well. So that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> well, listen, Tara, I really appreciate you carving out some time here today. If, last question for you is for f listeners who are really trying to, you know, untap the power of the source, you know, all the, the brain and all its complexity. And again, your book's tremendous. I, I initially had the audio book and that wasn't enough. So I had to get the physical copy so I could make yeah. some notes and everything else. So I definitely encourage yeah. everyone to, uh, to, to grab a copy. But for those who are, you know, just getting started or looking to get started, where's, what's one tip that you might give to, uh, to kick off this exploration into how they can really uh, harness the power of the brain? Mm -hmm. um, so one of my favorite tips is, Think about 10 things that you can change by 1% rather than one thing that you need to change by 10%. So what we tend to do is think, okay, this isn't working out. I need to, you know, make a big change to my diet or my exercise regime, like a big one. And, you know, the reason that New Year's resolutions tend to not work or we run out of steam within a month or two is because the change that we've taken on is too big. And whilst you're holding down the day job and your work-life balance, it's too much. So you very quickly feel like that you failed and then you, you don't want to pick it up again. If you just make a list today of 10 little things that you could do differently, like go to bed half an hour earlier, drink an extra glass of water every day, up unto a limit, yeah, obviously. Um, sure. um, you know, go, go out for a walk in the middle of the day or at least take 10 deep breaths maybe download a mindfulness app and start using it with your earphones and you know whatever else is right for you um those things are all much more doable and then there's a cumulative effect because very quickly you start to feel better because you've implemented some of those things then your brain has become more flexible and it's able to take on some of those bigger changes that you that deep down you desire but are too 
confronting to start with straight away. Fantastic. Fantastic tip, Tara. I really appreciate you carving out some time. You know, where can people stay connected with you and uh, pick up a copy of the new book? Oh, thank you. Um, I'm very active on social media. So I'm on Instagram, Dr. Tara Swart, DR Tara Swart, on Twitter, at Tara Swart. Um, my website is taraswart.com, and there's a book landing page there with links to um, Amazon in the US and the various booksellers around North America. Um, I will actually, I'm actually flying to Toronto after this. So, Fantastic. Um, I have family in Toronto, so I'll be spending the weekend there. Um, but I love to receive pictures from people on Instagram of them with the book in, you know, all over Canada and the USA. So yeah, I really look forward to connecting with people. And obviously I hope that people really enjoy the book. Fantastic. Well, listen to all the Canadians out there. Let's get some pictures from all over coast to coast (laughs) for Tara. So um, be fantastic. Well, listen, I appreciate you carving out some time, Tara. That's, that's terrific. And I know you're going to be doing some talks as well. So folks can check out your website and get all the details for that as well. And uh, yeah, best of luck with the rest of the, uh, with the book tour. And again, thanks so much for all the great work you do. Well, I'm so glad you enjoyed the book. And I'm really glad that we reconnected after all these years for me to be able to speak with you on your podcast.